Well, good afternoon, guys. It's uh, two in the afternoon, and that's a tough time to keep a crowd alert and awake, but I hope to get you engaged in the conversation. The ladies did a great job of getting engaged, and I think that helps a, a lot. It's a little bit awkward because most of these lessons are sermons that I had preached, and trying to uh, make that work with an interactive class is sometimes a little bit of a challenge, but I think it's working out okay. I, I uh, appreciate what uh, Jim has had to say uh, as he's introduced me uh, a couple of times now already, and I do remember he and Peggy from so many years ago. I also remember both of them's dads because they were both elders at the church at Southside when I moved there as a very young man to become a part of the training program. And I know the power, that they know the power of a, of a godly father in a person's life. And I've also been the beneficiary and, and recipient of that. I mentioned uh, last night, I think, that my, my father passed away early this year. And uh, that's a, it's a difficult thing. The other day, I, I, I'd heard other people talk about this kind of thing happening, but I remember very distinctly pulling into the church parking lot. I had just heard something on the news and instinctively reached for the phone because I was going to call Dad to talk to him about this and then that realization that you can't do that anymore. And uh, that's, a, that's a hard thing to, uh, to, to get used to. We all who have had good fathers uh, love our fathers and value that relationship so, so very much. But unfortunately, there are so many people in the world today and in America today who do not have that kind of a role model for a father. Some of you guys may not have had that kind of role model for a father. None of us have had perfect fathers, but some have had a what could only be described as a, a really, um, let's see this, that's okay. I think I'm just going to do without, do without that anyway. So we'll we'll just forego the PowerPoint. Um, s- some of us have had uh, some really difficult experiences with our father, and as a consequence, have this really aching void as a result of. It's on. Okay, really aching void as a result of the absence of a father in our life, and it could be described and has been described sort of as this primal ache of father hunger of this something is missing in our lives because there was never this father figure to be for us what we needed as children growing up. And it just sort of leaves this gnawing emptiness, this chasm, this void in our lives as we long for uh, a father and from all the things that come from having a good father. And um, that can come as a consequence of a number of, of things. There's basically three kinds of fatherhood that are big problems and that create this father hunger. One of them at the bottom here is just the absent father, the absentee father. The father is not there because he didn't stick around. He was there for, you know, to, to uh, create the child, but that was as far as his interests were concerned, and he has never been a part of the child's life. Uh, or he's physically there, but he's very emotionally disengaged and not spiritually involved in the child's life or who at some point along the way abandoned the family and abandoned uh, the child and um, that can be done as a result of a willful sinful choice Uh, sometimes it can happen as as a consequence of death and I don't know that abandon would be the right word to use there but at any rate as a consequence of his untimely passing he's no longer able to be Uh, involved in the child's life and so that would be like the absent father then maybe the worst of all would be the abusive father he's there and his presence is felt but it's a very painful experience and you would almost rather there be nothing than uh, than this kind of a, a father who's emotional physical and even sexual abuse and we read about that kind of thing all too often in today's world and then there's a a very common sort of uh, approach to fatherhood that maybe some of us have experienced in a very authoritarian style of, of fatherhood in which uh, law and order were, were the order of the day. And of course, that is part of the role that a father plays, I think, is to provide the discipline, is to provide the order and the, that kind of boundaries that a family needs to operate in. And so it's not all bad that he has an authoritative position in the family, but when that becomes tyrannical, when that crosses over the line that it's all about the rules all the time and the um, 
harsh enforcement of those uh, to the detriment sometimes of the relationship side and the nurturing side of bringing up children, that becomes a, a, a real issue for many. So what are, what are some of the consequences? Let's open this up a little bit. Some of the consequences of these problems that create this father hunger, these style of, uh, styles of uh, approaching fatherhood that we see maybe in our culture today. What are some of the consequences that you think you see in young people as a result of this kind of fa- approach to fathering? Yeah. Okay. So there's this, this need, this hunger, and with the father not being there or not fulfilling his role properly, the young person begins to look for that from some source that is likely to be less concerned about the well-being of, of the child. Yeah, yeah, I think we see that a great deal today. Role models that aren't good role models. Anybody else? Okay. Yes, they're, they're, um, if, if the father's if present and he's domineering, there's a pushback against that because I just can't stand this, this tight of uh, uh, almost oppressive sort of environment to live in, so we rebel against that. Or if there's, there's no one there and there's just this anger and misdirection, then the, the kid goes out and gets into all kinds of, of trouble. Yeah. No. Um, in some ways, the in some instances, maybe the child uh, matches um, the same behavior, okay. either in their uh, childhood um, or when they're uh, in a parent. When they uh, become a parent, parent. They, and tend, we tend to replicate the environment that we grew up in, and so it begins to be perpetuated generationally. And I think we see that, and uh, a lot, a lot of studies uh, they say indicate that kind of, of thing. It's the only model that we that we really know. So these are some areas that uh, cause some some serious problems. And I don't know if you know you, you see the anymore a lot of the the anarchist uh, you know on the news or whatever. And I think if you if you could control for all the other factors, socioeconomic factors, I'll bet you that the one most dominant characteristic. Uh, of people who are who are who are out behaving in this way is that there is a absence of a strong relationship with a father uh, in the, in their lives. That by and large, I, I can almost guarantee you that that is uh, at work. In fact, uh, there's a, a study that was done by Alan Blankenstein that I ran across the other day that said that uh, uh, those who grow up without a father in their uh, home are four times more likely to be in poverty. Seventy percent of uh, high school dropouts are fatherless, and uh, they are more than twice as likely to commit suicide. They're dramatically more at risk to abuse drugs or to become victims of sexual abuse and sex trafficking. Um, also, uh, we've, we've been some of uh, our members have recently become more involved in some prison ministry and looking into some research about that uh, somebody found that uh, one of the guys I don't know if it was in our group or or, or another group that they were familiar with but they decided they would um, provide all of the people that they were working with in the in the jail uh, Mother's Day cards so that they could send mom a note for, for Mother's Day and it was extremely popular. All the guys wanted to send their mom, you know, a thank you note. And so, like, 90% of the inmates requested a card to be able to, to send to their mothers. And then it was such a success that they decided, well, hey, Father's Day is coming around. We'll do the same thing with that. Almost zero. There were, like, two people out of the whole jail that wanted to send something to their dad. I think, again, it just speaks to this, this problem. Our jails are filled with young men who have no father 
or no father figure in their life, or they have looked to someone else besides their father to fill that void who has led them uh, very much astray. And I, I, I say all that, I'm going to skip a little bit here, um, to just try to remind all of us who are dads that we really do have an influence. It's a massive inf- influence. It's a huge influence that we have in our kids' lives, and we really need to appreciate that. I think that's sort of a beginning place for us is to, to come to grips with the fact that these little ones, these children that are growing up in our households, we really do have an enormous impact, not just on how they're going to do in school, not just how they're going to perform in the workplace, but their eternal well-being. I mean, these are people who are going to live forever, and I have been given the privilege, I've been given the responsibility of having an influence on their eternal life. I just uh, point out, like, the influence is going to come from somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, you see it nowadays, you know, unfortunately a lot of it's coming from what they see on social media, what their friends are saying, but it's going to come from somewhere, and how much more would we, would we rather be the ones that help develop that and control that and kind of guide that influence it coming from us instead of all the different as- avenues it, it can come from it's gonna it's gonna happen so absolutely you know uh, there's the passage in deuteronomy that talks about you know that you discuss these things discuss god's uh law with your children as you as you walk along the way with them as you go about your daily life with them and you th- you think back to ancient and agrarian societies like that, how much time parents probably did spend with their children, how much time fathers spent with their their sons, and versus today, in which the amount of just in terms of volume of time that we have to connect with our children is so much perhaps more limited than it it may have been in the past. And uh, the need, therefore, to recognize that we've got to make the most of every opportunity that we have because there are so many other influences now speaking into their lives trying to shape their character and their values that we really have got to leverage the the opportunities that we do have very good all right so we've got this influence but what we need is a model right we especially if you didn't grow up with a really godly example then where can we look to to find the kind of model that we need? And it, it dawned on me one day that God the Father is the example that all of us as fathers need to be looking to. And there's an instance in Jesus' life, Jesus the um, only begotten Son of God, uh, experienced in which I think there's sort of this archetypical way of thinking about fatherhood just laid out for us right here in Scripture. So I want to spend some time uh, just discussing this together. You're all perhaps familiar with the story. This is where Jesus goes to be baptized uh, by John at the Jordan. And in this uh, obviously significant event, when Jesus was baptized and he, and he came up out of the water, so here's a, a big event in Jesus' life, and notice who was there. At that moment, heaven was open. So heaven, uh, you know, this is a fascinating thing to me. This is, this is God's space, this is God's dimension, uh, whatever that is. We sometimes think of heaven as that location within the physical universe that resides, you know, over on the other side of the moon or something like that. But it's, it's, the, it's the realm in which God inhabits, the spiritual realm. And whatever the space between what we experience, and that is, I don't know exactly. In some ways, it's very far away. In other ways, it's, it's immediate. It's right here with us. And in some sense, at Jesus' baptism, this veil between heaven and earth is open, and Jesus has this immediate experience uh, of heaven and with the Father. And as it's opened, he sees something. He sees the Spirit of God descending like a dove, and lighting upon him. So at this highly important event in Jesus' life, it's one of those questions that's so obvious nobody wants to answer, but who's there? His father is is there. His his father's not only there, but his father, how would you describe what's taking place here? God the Father's presence 
is what? I know it's a really vague question. Manifested. The Spirit manifests the presence of the Father. Uh, was Jesus able to discern this? Yeah, it was discernible to Jesus. I don't, again, I don't know exactly what this kind of thing might look like, but Jesus is able to discern the Father's presence at this critical moment in his life. And so it's a, a, a sort of a palpable presence there. It's like you can, you can feel it. So as fathers, what might, just going this far into the event, tell us a little bit about the role we should play in our children's lives? Yeah, they should feel our presence. We, we should be there. We need to be present in their lives, and our presence in their lives needs to be something that's palpable to them, that they know we're there, uh, in a meaningful way, I think is is the idea. Um, not this sort of old school mentality of, well, it's, you know, mom's the one who's going to make her presence felt in the kid's life, and I'm just going to be the provider who sort of keeps keeps a distance. I don't see that here. Again, the distance between heaven and earth, however far away that is, is removed and the presence of the Father is immediately experienced by Jesus the Son in this moment in a way that he can uh, truly feel. So he's present and he is engaged. What are some ways in which we can be present and engaged with our children? Just some simple things, not looking for anything profound necessarily. Eat dinner together. together. (laughs) You know, just... The most mundane thing, because that's where life is lived. It's in the mundane, right? It's in the everyday events. And when we say, okay, obviously there's going to be exceptions that come along, but as a course of life, this family gathers around a physical table with food on it, and we sit down for a period of time, and we eat together, and we do that every day. I will tell you guys... um, you know, my youngest son is now 16, almost 17, and he's beginning, you know, more and more to have his, his things that he's, he's doing. But throughout the time of our children coming up, this was just a given. We ate dinner together uh, every night. And the conversations <laughs> that we had and the bonding experiences that came from that are absolutely priceless. There's nothing on TV that I could have sat at a TV tray and eaten without the family being around that could come close to the memories and experiences that I had and that they had with with me and their mother from that environment. Um, And one of the things that we tried to do, usually beginning with the youngest to the oldest, was I would ask questions, you know, what happened today? Tell me something that happened today. Did somebody do anything nice for you? Things that get them thinking, yeah, my sister did this today. Oh, great. Well, what did you do nice for somebody today? And, you know, you can ask specific questions. And the thing about little kids, you can ask the same questions every day for five years, and they don't really get tired of it. So it's, it's great. And I, I would often uh, come up with crazy stories, too, about something that happened that day, and they would love that. And you can, you can make fun and have a good time and, and really grow close to your children just from something as simple as making the decision, we're going to eat together uh, every day that we possibly can. Yes. Okay, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Piano recitals, honestly, guys, are just not my thing. <laughs> Would never go to one. But if my daughter's playing in a piano recital and there's any possible way I can be there, I'm going to be there for her, right? And I think that this event, obviously, Jesus' baptism is the beginning of his, his personal ministry and an extremely significant event in Jesus' life. And the Father is there. He shows up. He's present. 
Yes. Yes, they're gaining a competency, I can't say that word, competency for life by working alongside you. And it does, it gives them confidence. And I love the way that sometimes when you have uh, another person, uh, even your own children that maybe you have difficulty communicating with directly, face to face, it seems awkward or something. It's amazing when instead of looking face to face, you stand shoulder to shoulder doing a job, a task together, that conversation becomes much easier and natural and and things can be discussed that you you wouldn't uh without sharing in in some work together great yeah to to tag along with that i really do think that confidence building is just a huge part of um that relationship especially at a young young age with your kids um whether you're doing something with them that's helping them train or being at their events that are special to them, just having that presence is, is a big confidence boost uh, in their development and allows them to start realizing the things that they can do. And, and, you know, even in this example that you're talking about with Jesus, you know, he's about to go through, he's about to enter into his ministry. He's about to go through a lot of things in the next few years that are going to be difficult. Mm. And having the support of his father coming and saying, you know, descending on him, showing that support and saying, this is whom I'm well pleased. It's a confidence builder for what he's about to take on. Absolutely. And that's, that's your prescient because that's exactly where we're heading with this. Uh, and then the next verse, uh, in fact, um, uh, he hears a voice. So not only is the father present and making his presence felt in some sort of a tangible way, but he also speaks in in the moment. His voice is heard, and so communicating with our our children becomes uh, an important thing that is is taught here. Saying actual words to our children, even if we're not the most talkative people in the world, we still need to try to communicate with our children, and uh, one of the best things you can do is just simply ask questions, right? Um, Tell me about your day, and there's going to come a point, those of you guys who have young children that, that haven't gotten to the middle school and high school age, yeah, there's going to come a point where they don't want to tell you about their day anymore. So if they go on and on and on telling you about their details while they're young, soak it up because they may come when it's like I picked Joshua up uh, from school or something and and, uh, how was your day? It's fine. (laughs) You get one word answers. So it gets, uh, it can become tough at some point, but uh, uh, letting them know and and expressing it verbally uh, to them and, and then specifically, uh, what does this voice from heaven, what does the Father say? The, these are so powerful. He says, first, this is my son. Just think about the power of that statement. This is my son. What does that do? What is, what is the Father doing here? Affirmation. Affirmation. Yes, and specifically what's being affirmed here? A relationship. What relationship? The closest, yeah. Father, son. It's, it's, he's speaking an identity into to Jesus, isn't he? He's, he's claiming the relationship. Um, I still remember, I don't know why this stands out, but my dad was like in the Kiwanis Club or one of those service organizations and I was just a little bitty kid and they they did one of these charity basketball games or something I don't I don't even know what it was but I remember that you know after the game dad was standing there with some of the other men of the community talking about stuff and and mom let me go down there and I'm standing next to dad who I just saw you know playing basketball on this basketball court and I walk up and dad sees me coming and he, he, he encourages me over and, and tells the other guys, hey, guys, this is Lawrence, this is my son. 
And for whatever reason here, 40-something years after that, I'm 52, I was probably like six years old or something at the time, I just still totally remember that. Because it was like, here's somebody that I was in that moment particularly just admiring, and he is claiming a connection with me. And I think it was one of those formative moments in my life where I was getting a sense of who I am. And it came from an authority figure, the most important authority figure in my life at that time, claiming me as his son. And we've got a guy at church that's great about that. Everywhere you go, Tra- Travis Keller, if, if, you, if you meet him or and his children are around, he's going to tell you, I'm Travis Keller and this is my son Rex. This is my son Tyson. And so I think taking every opportunity that we can to claim the relationship, to show an identification with our children, to give them a sense of whose they are is critical. Because we don't really know how to act in the world until we have some sense of our identity, who, who we are. And we don't really have a sense of identity until we know whose we are. None of us are just isolated entities. We all exist within a network of relationships. And as y'all have already indicated, this relationship is vital. And so if we want our kids to manifest themselves in the world confidently and with integrity and with character, that's going to begin with them having a sense of knowing whose they are and therefore who they are. Yeah. I think another thing about this statement, oh. another thing about this statement is um, it's, it's giving direction. I mean, you're claiming him, but you're also giving him direction in some sense by, you know, he's doing the right thing or whatever, you know, it's a, af- I guess affirmation, but it is somewhat instructive. Okay. Yeah. So. It, it provides information for him to, to have uh, that will, will direct him in his actions. I think that's good. Um, and then that leads then to, to the next the, statement, which is a statement of affirmation. Yes. Just before you go on from that, you know, this isn't the only time he says that. No. And so the fact that it's a repeated thing, it's okay. not a one and done. Yeah, I told him when he was little, but it has to be repeated okay. over and over. Very good. Yeah, again, at the uh, Transfiguration, doesn't he? he? He makes a similar statement. This, this is my son. And here he, he adds uh, this phrase, whom I, whom I love. So now he's not only acknowledging relationship, but he is expressing uh, his affection, verbally expressing his affection. Uh, how many of you guys find verbal expressions of affection difficult? Does anybody? I sometimes find that difficult I think you know just I don't know I don't know if it's a personality trait if it's a guy thing or if it's a generational thing I definitely think years gone by men had a harder time with with that than they than they do being transparent with how we feel about that and expressing it to to a person but the father here not only identifies Jesus as his son but expresses his love for his son now some of you have already mentioned this um, and how this event and the words that are communicated in it connect with the rest of Jesus' life and his, his ministry. I think you mentioned that a few moments ago. But I want to take just a few moments before we come back and finish this out and jump one chapter next. Does anybody remember what happens immediately after Jesus' baptism? The temptation. The temptation. And when Satan comes to Jesus, notice the line of attack that he uses what does he ask jesus in matthew 4 3 if right if what if you are the son of god he's attacking him at the point of his self-understanding at his point of identity right who are you Um, what were jesus circumstances well he was in the wilderness for 40 days fasting right uh, I know some of you, you, you guys know John Banks, right? He's the only person I've ever known. I think he fasted for 40 days a, a year or two back. That's just astonishing. He's the only person beside Jesus that I know of who's fasted for 40 days. I fast for 40 minutes, and I, I can't hardly make it. I've got to wind this up pretty soon because I've got to eat again. It's just an astonishing thing, but to, not to make too much light of it, because the reality is that Jesus is at a weakened state, Right? vulnerable, uh, physically 
vulnerable and weak. And it's in those moments that Satan comes to attack. He will always attack at the weakest point. And he attacks Jesus at the point of his identity. Because does it look, you know, if, if you, you could imagine what the life of the Son of a God, certainly the Son of the God, would be like in this world, certainly it would be a, a great life, a, a life of power, a life of plenty. And, in, and Jesus is in precisely the opposite situation. It looks like anything but what Jesus' self-understanding is to be the Son of God. And so Satan attacks him there. And what that tells me is that the words that the Father had spoken before wasn't just information, but it was food. When the Father said, this is my Son, whom I love, that wasn't just to give Jesus information that was true, but also to feed his soul when he would come under temptation. In fact, I think it's interesting that in the next verse, Jesus' response is, man does not live by bread alone, but by what? Every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Father. And then you think about, well, what was the last words that had proceeded from the mouth of the Father that Jesus had heard? You're my son. I love you. So what words were food for Jesus in the wilderness when he was weak and vulnerable and being attacked at the question of who he was, it was the words the Father had spoken. And when your daughter and your son is away from your home and in some environment where they are vulnerable and weak and caused to be in doubt or in question, what words will you have spoken as their father into their life that are going to give them a sense of self to sustain them against these competing voices that want to take them astray are they going to have enough confidence in who they are and whose they are that they'll she'll be able to say no to her boyfriend or he'll be able to say no to his buddies who are trying to get him into trouble because we've been there we've been present enough in their life to give them this anchor I think it's just uh one of the most amazing things and so uh back to Matthew 3 there's one last phrase here that that the father makes not only is this my son in whom I am well pleased, uh, whom I love, but I am also well uh, pleased. Um, I mentioned to the, your wives or the ladies this morning something from the parable that Jesus tells about the parable of the, the talents. And you have the uh, five, and I, I still can't remember, three, Curtis, two, two, five talent, two talent, and one talent man. And uh, the five and two talent men have an attitude toward their master, who's a stand-in for God, for the Lord. Their attitude toward him is that he can be pleased. And they are excited about the news that their master has returned, and they can't wait to show him what they've done with what they have been given. But the one talent man said, no, I, I knew you to be a hard master. I knew you to be the type of man that nobody could please. And so he went and dug and hit it in the ground and then just brought him back what he had been given. Our attitude toward our father makes a big difference in how we live our life. And we don't want to be the kinds of fathers who our sons and daughters believe it's impossible to please. And this is a one of those things that there's some tension in trying to figure out because we all want to have standards and seek excellence in our children and inspire them to as, as, uh, become as much as they can be. But there's a way of doing that that can do more harm than good and that can discourage. And I think sometimes we're afraid to tell them, good job, or that's great, I'm proud of you, because we think, ah, oh, I think they could have done a little bit better. And as a result, they grow up with the impression that I can't, I can't ever please him. He'll never be happy. I'll never be good enough. Yes. I think some of the recent secular writers make a real good analogy with this. They talk about an emotional bank account and the fact that when you put deposits in, then you can make withdrawals. 
But if you don't put deposits in, then you can't make withdrawals. And there are going to be times when you have to be critical. Yeah. But if you've been positive 90% of the time, one withdrawal isn't going to ruin the relationship. But if all you do is make withdrawals and never put in a deposit, they quit listening real quick. Very good. Very good analogy. Go bankrupt in a hurry if you only make withdrawals. Yes. Um, expectations are... I think a good thing, but uh, where I feel sometimes that you know, even in my own um, experiences, when I try to have my children reach my expectations instead of actually helping them develop what the expectations are for them that they're are their own, mm -hmm. um, I'll tend to be end up in situations where maybe they don't reach what I, I think and they feel in some way that they are not, aren't, aren't pleasing me. And it's something to be very careful of that when we're setting those expectations, is it, is it, is it my expectations for them? Is it God's expectations for them? Is it developing their expectations in conjunction with what obviously God wants for them? Um, you know, it's, it, it takes, it's a hard thing to kind of balance, but um, that's something I always feel I have to keep keep in mind. Yes, good, very good point. Well, all right. Well, then to to wrap up, because uh, I I know we're at that point of the day where we're wearing thin, but I think a, a heart turns towards your children, like the father shows here, means that we're present in their life, that we're making our presence felt in, in a meaningful way and that we're speaking words of identification and affirmation uh, into their lives such that that relationship is, is strong and they can endure temptation and the tests of life that, that lay ahead. And God our Father, in his relationship with Jesus, models this for us. Anything else uh, that anybody wants to say about anything? Yes. I think... Um, and, and, and this, I think, brings out a lot of the points that you were making. I look back at my relationship with my father. The one thing that I wanted to do was please my father. Because uh, um, I can remember where the times where I did something that wasn't good, the look on his face crushed me. Yeah. Um, and I think back to our Heavenly Father and how he feels you know, I mean, he, he's hurt when we do something. And you, you begin to understand as a parent, you know, why we always say this hurts me more than it hurts you. And, and, I, and I look back at my children. So the mom was who they always went to for comfort. But the one they always wanted to please was me and had to know that. And so you have to do all of these things um to encourage that i mean you have to affirm them you have to identify them and all of that because that's what they want because they want to please you and then you know that makes discipline easier because then uh, i think because then when they don't please you i mean and you let them know i mean uh yes you're hurt but they're they're understanding they're hurt too so uh i just think to understand i think children you know, the, when they when they scrape their knee, they're going to run to their mom for comfort. But for most things in life, they want the dad's identification and affirmation because they, they want to be pleasing to their dad when the dad is there. Join us on Sunday as we worship. We'd love to have you. and We hope that uh, you could be benefited by the lessons we provide. Hope to see you then. <laughs>